Anyway, you all know how to spell principal, don't we? Because they're your pal, P-R-I and C-I-P-A-L. So anyway, I always do that. Um, I used to be a teacher um, for many, many years. Um, from uh, actually taught in a Montessori school, at a preschool for a, a good while, as well through elementary for many years and a high school and college teacher. So. Uh, I'm very honored today that Mary Beth O'Brien from the Gilmore School is with us. She's been with us before. She was here two years ago when the Huntington left the Huntington and became the Gilmore, which is across the way. Um, and we have a, a holiday tradition here every year at the Gilmore School. Um, comes and does um, the early part of Christmas celebrations with us with their walk, with their lantern walk. And Lynn Smith, um, which is directly behind our cameraman, is largely responsible for that. So it's really kind of old home week here. So we invited Mary Beth back uh, because she's our pal, P-A-L, and, um, and to talk about what's gone on at the Gilmore School. We've just had at our table here really interesting questions about education in general, not just um, you know um, what's happening today at the Gilmore School, but um, what's going on with testing and, you know, and um, as a former teacher, as a veteran teacher, I will say that the first line of defense in any school are its teachers. And, and sadly, and I'm going to, this is an opinion, and you rarely hear the pastor give an opinion, teachers are the first people who are attacked. And, and so, um, and that's sad because I, I don't know of one teacher in my life, rarely, that who, didn't, who did not advocate for students first and foremost, and that's also the job of an administration. We're there because of the students, and um, in the same way that I'm here because of uh, parishioners and people who come to worship in a part of this community. So enough um, uh, plug for that, but Mary Beth is speaking with us. Um, next week, uh, Lynn Smith is gonna speak to us. She's speaking to us about the Keith Park Association, all the things that she does in this community, the upcoming Easter egg hunt at the Fruit Center across the way, all those sorts of civic things that she's a part of. I believe it's um, Swedish meatballs next week. Yes, it is, it's Swedish meatballs. So please, please come for that. And um, uh, you also have yellow cards on your table and some pens. So let us know that you came today. Um, if you wanna be on a mailing list, anything like that, comments, uh, suggested speakers, how much you love the lunch, all of those things. Um, and finally, before I introduce Principal O'Brien, let's have a word of grace. Gracious God, thank you for today and all the blessings of this life. Thank you especially for our educators and the enormous work that they do in bringing up our young people in this place to become uh, not only really smart, but to be really excellent citizens of both Brockton and Massachusetts as the nation as well as the world. Thank you for the food that has been given us today and uh, for the nourishment of our bodies. Keep us mindful of the needs of others and always help us to remember those who have nothing to eat and know where to lay their heads. All this we ask in your name that is holy. Amen. Amen. And please help me welcome Mary Beth O'Brien. It's really hard for me to be in front of a microphone because my voice projects, so I'm going to step slightly away from it. If I'm too loud, let me know. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mary Beth O'Brien. I am the principal of the Gilmore Elementary School, which is just over the bridge right behind uh, the church. And it's so nice to be here because this is a very special place for our Gilmore students, which we call our uh, Gilmore Hawks or Gilmore Scholars. We're a K-5 to elementary school. Uh, about two years ago, we moved over from the Huntington Elementary School, which is just in front of the church, about two streets over. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have either attended the Huntington School. Usually, whenever I'm here at the First Evangelical Lutheran, uh, there are always parishioners who have either attended the, the Huntington, uh, marched in the Huntington School Parade, which is one of our very favorite events of the year, um, or your educators yourselves. I know that in the past there have been uh, former Brockton Public Schools educators, principals, um, and other administrators in the room. So. It's always a pleasure to be among friends. 
Um, so a couple of things about our school. Uh, you'll notice that if you're ever in the community when students are coming and going, our students um, are easily recognizable with their navy blue collared shirts and khaki pants. And that's something that's unheard of really in public schools, right? You'll often question, are they um, part of a parochial school or are they part of a charter? But um, we started some initiatives about nine years ago um, under an amazing leader, June Saber McGuire, and a lot of those initiatives still ring true. And one of the things that are really important to the work that we're doing at the Gilmore um, that we began when we were at the Huntington is just ways to really reignite education for our urban youth here in the community of Brockton. So we recognized a couple of needs that were happening among our students. Um, and one of that was providing them with um, an equal playing field so that when they sat in a classroom and looked to the left and looked to the right, they felt included and part of an inclusive classroom. And the first thing was to break down those barriers of who had what and what their socioeconomic status was. So here, all of our students wear the same thing and it unites us and creates a nice little community known as the Gilmore Hawks. Um, but there's more than that. When you walk into the Gilmore School, or actually before you even walk in, you see a beautiful mural that we had painted on the side of the school. It's bright and vibrant. Uh, Laura Donato actually um, brought a team of high school and uh, students from both the Southeastern Regional as well as Brockton High and you saw them just put their passion on the side of the wall. That really replicates um, the history of the Campello community. It focuses on the lively education that's happening today but also the education of the past and the fact that there has been so many people that have walked through the corner of Campello that we exist in um, to really bring back all of those old school values but bringing us forward to today's values including technology. But the one thing that has always remained very consistent is that of needing a community to bring education uh, really alive but also the sense of family and the sense of the history that has brought us where we are. So that's really important to us at the Gilmore. Um, in addition to that, of course, we're focused on education. But prior to even focusing on that, the most important thing is to make sure everybody feels like they're part of something, part of a school, part of a community, and part of a family. And what um, we've really worked on as a school is connecting with the Campello community. So between the Campello Business Association, which includes this church as well as the Trinity Baptist, uh, including the neighborhood associations, which where is there a neighborhood association without Lynn Smith right at the center? But Lynn has been such a big part of helping us help our students and families feel connected to the community. The Brockton Public Library has been a big part of what we do, the Old Colony YMCA and Bridgewater State University. And one thing that we recognize, and people laugh at me mainly because um, hawks aren't part of a flock. I think there's something else. But I always say it takes a flock to raise a hawk. And each one of you are part of that flock, right? Connecting to the community, finding outside organizations to help support what we're doing so that school doesn't end with the bell. It extends beyond the bell. And that's the opportunities that this church provides with after school programming and meals and shelter and different um, events that we get to host collaboratively. Um, having a park nearby with green space, with the beauty that helps kids feel that they are in a place that is fun, right, and vibrant. And what kids need is a backyard to play in. So our parks and our different recreational spaces allow for that. And of course, the joy of holding a book in your hand, which the library is right down the street. Um, so all of those things are really necessary in order to help our students grow and thrive both before, during, and after the bell. So we thank you very much for that. Um, I won't bore you so much with giving you uh, all of the initiatives that we're engaged in and all of those things, but I did bring um, a little uh, flyer for you that kind of gives you a sense of our school, which I'll pass out after, but I'd rather it be somewhat back and forth and engaging about what um, school is today, because it has changed quite a bit. Um, do you have anything you want to ask, or Lynn? Sure. 
So um, the, the unique thing about the Gilmore, and we're the only school in Brockton that does this, but when we originally started nine years ago, we were one of 16 elementary schools that had what's called an expanded learning time day. Now we're part of a national organization, and there are thousands of schools that do this, but we recognize that in a lot of cases, depending on the parameters around your school and your um, population, that there are just, a six hour school day just doesn't allow you to get everything in to close achievement gaps, the opportunity gap and the engagement gap. So we came together as a school staff and we recognized that we needed to do some things, uniforms being one of them. Um, but with that said, uh, we decided that we needed to lengthen the school day. So our school begins at 7.25 in the morning and gets out at 3.25 in the afternoon. So you're probably trying to do the math in your head. It, it, it's about 90 additional minutes more than the standard or average elementary school. So you're probably saying, well, what do you do with those 90 extra minutes? And of course, some of the things that we recognize under Maslow's, Maslow's higher or hierarchy of needs is that we do provide students with additional meals, we provide them with dental care, we provide them with health care, and so many other things. But in addition to that, we are given the, um, the allowance with those extra hours to really go deeper into different curriculum areas, including things like STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. We offer a one-to-one -one technology initiative. But in addition to that, when I talked earlier about those outside partners, we bring outside partners in to provide enrichment opportunities for students, which is really critical. Some of those uh, enrichment opportunities, the YMCA comes in and they teach students um, under the Search Institute's uh, curriculum around building those inner character qualities like resiliency, empathy, um, all of those social, emotional, interactive, cooperative learning um, things that our students um, might be lacking or just giving them more time to develop those, especially knowing that when we start kindergarten at five years old, there's so much play that children need, but there's also academics that need to balance that. So the YMCA helps us with that. We have a program called Imagine Arts that comes in once a week in our kindergarten, and they teach the students music and music, uh, music paired with literacy and then some movement. Um, but Bridgewater State University is also one of our partners where we've become a learning lab for Bridgewater. So students that are aspiring to become educators, they do a lot of their practicum work at our school. So that's on the job training before they become teachers so that they know what the expectations are for them in real schools with real children and real challenges. Because that's one thing that you can never prepare for is what the challenges are when you become a first year teacher. So we've been given the opportunity to bring in these outside organizations to support it. One of our other favorite um, enrichment partners is Science from Scientists. It's a nonprofit organization. They have also granted uh, this particular year, they have given an honorary award to one of our teachers for her leadership in science. Um, and establishing this partnership, and we're in our third year. But they come in and they're real scientists, and every other week they provide science modules to our fourth and fifth graders as if they're in real life science laboratories. So what is that doing? That's providing that inspiration and those ideas to help students develop goals to one day see themselves as scientists, engineers, mechanics, architects, all of those jobs that seems so far away for a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old. Any other questions? Susan? Tell me why you love your job, because I know you do. I love my job. I was in a um, second grade classroom today, and a child looked up at me and goes, Miss O'Brien, are you a teacher or just a principal? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm a teacher. So, and that's the beauty of, of this job is that you're never, you never forget that you were a teacher first and an educator and really getting into those classrooms, rolling up your sleeves and sitting down with kids and learning with them. That's the best part of the job. Um, the other big part of it, and I guess I don't really know why I became a principal, to be honest, it just kind of happened. No, it didn't, but um, I ask myself that sometimes, but it's the ability to provide students with the resources that they need and their families and most importantly teachers because they, 
truly are, I mean, without kids, we wouldn't need teachers, right? We need educators, but essentially, the educator is the most important person that is going to impact the life of a child when they are in school, especially in a school that has eight and a half hour days. So in this role, it's listening, it's understanding, it's being in classrooms, and it's knowing what a teacher needs in order to get the job done and close those gaps. And there are so many, right? We're not just talking about academics, but we're talking about social emotionally, what we need to provide for our students, and that's where the community is so important because you're, you never stop educating the youth, right? Um, there was a, a politician who said education pays, right? So if we invest in education at, at the most earliest onset, what it ends up doing is that's your investment into the future of what society is going to be 20 years from now, right? And somebody someday invested in me. I am Brockton born and raised, kindergarten all the way until my senior year. And then I landed back here, right? So, and I never left. So I live just right up, um, I guess that would be the s southwest side of the city, walking distance from the Gilmore, actually walking distance from the Huntington because I'm definitely an absent-minded person that used to get myself locked out of my house. But yet I still had to be at school, so there I would be with all of my school bags walking in my heels um, to get myself to school. So it's nice to be part of a community part of the educational process and investing in our children, and I hope that you see the same value in that. Uh, it's funny that Jim was asking me to say something about something that I was going to ask about. I didn't know about this time. I noticed uh, as one of Lynn's helpers when we were at the school getting things ready, and uh, uh, how well we did the children. was not like the typical schoolyard. And there were so many fathers there. It was so, it just lit my heart up to see men stepping up, perhaps their wives were working, whatever, but the father got there, and that's so important. Did you notice my father was there too? <laughs> <laughs> I made him come for the first year. <laughs> um, yes, so. <laughs> So um, I will say that we have done a really, really good job of, of trying to present so many opportunities for families to come in, and that's what it is. I mean, I will tell you, you're probably familiar with a PTO or a PAC, a parent-teacher organization or a parent advisory council, and truth be told, that's a thing of the past, right? In today's day and age, that is looked at more as an archaic structure of education. Um, so some of the great things that we've done as a school community is look for different ways to engage families because in all honesty, when you're out working one or two or even three jobs, it's hard to find additional time to come into a school and then take on another job, right? And that's often what a PAC or a PTO is able to do. Um, so essentially we try to build in so many structures where parents see school as being another space for them to collaborate and engage even at the adult level. So with the help of the YMCA, one of the structures we created was something called Parent Cafe. So it's a different way of looking at what a PTO or a PAC's purpose is in school, and that's not what this is, but a PAC or a PTO allows for parents becoming leaders in the school to advocate for their children, to support the school, and to make school fun for kids. Well, what we did with Parent Cafe is the YMCA brought this to us and they've trained a group of our parents, but they're essentially establishing leaders among our parents. The topics are not about school. They're about things that impact families today. And they find a non-threatening way. We serve dinner and there are a series of questions that engage parents in discussion. The students go off and they play. Maybe it's in the gym. Uh, the other day, um, I actually supported the students while the parents had their discussion and we, um, we made like sea animals out of clay, it was quite fun. But it's the children, they, they get to step away from their children for a little while and they get to spend some time talking with other parents that have similar needs, wants and desires and they get to build or establish those structures and those conversations and what ends up happening is they grow as a community themselves so that they don't feel like they are one person alone in the world, 
It's this is my school, these are my, my peers as an adult, and how can we connect together? So, and then just growing your structures from there and giving parents a voice, and it helps because in a lot of ways you don't know you have one, right? You don't know that's your place is to step into a school and say, how can I help? What can I do? Can you help me? And that's really what we try to build at the Gilmore. Hi. With the budget cuts in the school, how did that affect you and your school? So I'm sure you've paid quite a bit of attention to the equity in education lawsuit. Um, it's something that Superintendent Smith has really taken charge on and really advocated for the students of Brockton. The funding formula really um, created our $16 million deficit in Brockton. We hope that we're starting to stabilize a little bit. But in the last five years, we've suffered a great deal. We have lost great, uh, a great deal of human capital, so that's people who can do those really great jobs of supporting children who have academic achievement gaps. We have lost, um, we have lost students in some ways uh, as a result of us having such large class size. Students that used to walk to our school have to get sent to other schools because our class size is so large, we have no place for them to go. Um, some of the things that we've also been challenged with, I would say, is as an ELT school when we started this nine years ago, our teachers stayed at our school. They never wanted to leave. They were part of something. They built something there. They developed the conditions for learning that were what our students needed. That's what made us uniquely different than a traditional elementary school. With the budget cuts led to layoffs, teacher layoffs. And as a result of teacher layoffs, our first, last year, we experienced a shortage, not a shortage, because we still had teachers, but our teacher turnover rate in a school that didn't typically have one, we had 44% of our staff were new. Then this year, we experienced layoffs again as a result of the residual effects of five years of budget cuts, and they kept happening. This year, we opened our doors, and 32% of our staff were new. 22%, I'm sorry, I stand corrected, 22%. So you bring those numbers together and you're essentially trying to develop your school all over again. And when you have been an ELT school, an expanded learning time school, what happens is there are three tenants to your expanded learning time uh, programming. One is additional time on learning done right, every minute counting, so that's not just extra time to play, there's very strategic, structured schedules. So we have that, but it takes some stamina to get used to teaching in an eight and a half hour day at elementary school with so much contact time with kids. So that's the first piece. So time on learning, additional time on learning is one tenant of expanded learning time. The second one is professional teacher collaboration. What research shows is that you can invest in professional development in the workforce for anyone in any discipline, but what really drives or moves practice or change is support and learning from your colleagues or your peers. So building time and structures in for teachers to collaborate with one another, get into each other's classrooms, focus on new strategies, new practices, new pedagogy. So collaboration is the second tenant. And the third tenant is enrichment opportunities with students. Well, in order to provide enrichment opportunities for students, you need to have partners to do that, right? Because we have acad our academic schedule to teach, and when a classroom teacher is already teaching eight and a half hours, you gotta go outside of that realm in order to bring more enrichment opportunities for students. So that's where our outside partners come in. But finding outside enrichment partners that don't cost a whole lot of money is tough to do. Everything comes with a price. So our enrichment structures have started to change. I rattled off quite a few enrichment partners that we have, but the great thing about them is we have leveraged our resources so that they and we as a school can balance each other off so that it's not costing such an exorbitant amount of money. But with that said, we've also lost things. So we've had to change those enrich enrichment structures. I, this handout also talks a little bit more about those losses more in depth. Um, so you'll be able to see that. Um, this is a vast question to answer, but what can we as a community do? I mean, what, is there something we can do that's immediate or long term? 
that's probably what I should have brought, but I can uh, provide that for you when you can maybe hand it out um, at the next luncheon. Um, but the equity and education lawsuit, uh, Superintendent Smith had a forum um, last Monday, and really, um, you can speak up to uh, your local um, local politicians and more importantly at the state and federal level uh, to advocate for more funding for public schools because really that's, that's what it is. Um, as you know, um, your voices matter more than, than ours because they wanna hear how you wanna build your community up and I can't stress enough that education is what is going to build a community. It's at the center. At the center of every good community is a solid school and a solid church, right? Because that's what brings people in, it inspires, it educates, it motivates, and that's where change happens. So really and truly, when we invest in youth, that's what matters the most. So I would say pay very close attention to the equity and education lawsuit, pay attention to the state and federal budget when you're hearing about where they wanna spend their money. Spend money on education. It's the one thing that will never be wasted. Um, uh, I know that uh, Principal O'Brien really helped with, we answered, she, she, she entertained our questions, which is great. Um, and it, uh, once again, as I started this conversation, and that's what it really is, it's a conversation, and we are partners here um, with the Gilmore School and with education, and so, um, uh, and I won't wax on about this, but in, people ask me all the time as a clergy person, what has happened to the church in the world in American society, say in the last 50 or 60 years, and I'm even looking at my dear colleague, Pastor Ken Yurkland, um, 50, 60 years ago, the church was at, cent at the center of culture in any American city or town, whereas the church has moved to the periphery of that circle, where but another piece of the United Way, the this, the that, and the other thing. <clears throat> Whereas I think because of the changes in society, and we could go on all afternoon about what those are, the church has figured out that in order to be a part of what we call public theology, we have to have a public theology. And, um, and as much as a school, and, and Mary Beth spent 25 minutes telling us of the ethos of, of what the DNA of what makes the Gilmore School tick and why it's important. And the same sort of language can be used with the church. And I'm so glad she coupled the two, the church and the school. So um, in order to have a strong property, you've got to have a strong public school system. And I come from a long line of educators, and I certainly agree with that. And we Lutherans here are all about teaching. Uh, Martin Luther was a great, great theological mind and an educator himself, as well as his family. So, um, anyway, thank you, Mary Beth. That was very moving. And, um, and please speak to her about things that you feel you can do individually or we as a community. Um, please fill out the yellow cards and tell us what you thought of today, the food, uh, if you want to be on our mailing list, um, the speakers um, that you've seen. Um, because this event is about you. Okay, let's give her a great big hand. And certainly our ladies, our, our lunchroom staff, who made a wonderful meal for today. Thumbs up on the um, shrimp jambalaya. Yes. Yeah.